I'd like to talk to you today about the causes of chronic rhinosinusitis, and specifically, as Dr. Pasali mentioned, um, using the evidence that is in the um, recent uh, publication that we put together and uh, critically examining what it is that we think causes sinusitis, what evidence we have for, um, for that belief of what causes it. So we'll review the latest research findings and um, hopefully with that improve the understanding of the breadth and the possible etiologies of rhinosinusitis. We'll differentiate between relationships that are the cause and effect where one thing causes another thing um, as opposed to two things happening together that are not related to one another. And I think it's very important for us to understand that difference. We'll also understand the impact that these, these etiologies have and that their interactions have on the treatment of patients with sinusitis. When we are in our clinics, um, so often we see patients that are suffering from sinus problems. And so as you go back to your clinic on Monday, what is it that you will be able to take from this lecture? I hope that will help you to treat your patients. Um, we see patients with inflammation in the sinuses on endoscopy and on computed tomography on CT. We can see that inflammation. And we saw something like this earlier this morning where the symptoms um, of sinusitis that will go up, they will go down over time, but they never go completely away. And why is that? What is it that is causing these symptoms to not completely resolve, or what are the many things that might be causing them? As I said, what we're going to be doing is looking at the evidence in the literature in peer-reviewed studies on what possibly can be causing sinusitis. And I want to point out that in this um, publication from last year, um, my, our colleague, Dr. Pasali, uh, was an important contributor. He's lower in the list only because of the alphabet. All the, uh, all the authors are listed by alphabet except for the first four uh, that were editors in the project. But he had a very important role to play. Let me explain what this was. This was an, uh, a collaboration of 140 authors from around the world um, that came together um, over the internet. We, didn't, we never actually met in a meeting but over the internet and, and wrote this together. We used a rigorous systematic review of the literature through late 2014. We used a pro process of evidence-based review, that's what this stands for, evidence-based review with recommendations. This was a process defined by Luke Rudnick and Tim Smith. It involves a, an author, submitting the initial draft of a portion of uh, a topic. So we would look at whether allergy causes sinusitis, for instance. And the first author would submit that to one of the editors, and then we would send that out to another expert, but without the name of the author um, being known. And that way, we all felt a little more free to be critical of the author's work and to, uh, to look at it very closely so that we didn't feel like we were hurting anyone's feelings. Um, we would then send that review to the original author, and then we would do this multiple times, three or four times, for each of 144 topics. It took about a year and a half to do this, and it resulted in nearly 200 pages with nearly uh, 1,500 references um, of the evidence. And this, uh, the scope of the document is looking at the etiology and management of um, all of rhinosinusitis, including acute, recurrent acute, chronic, and pediatric chronic rhinosinusitis. We rigorously graded the evidence for each one of these 1,500 references. Um, and we use this Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine so that systematic reviews and meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials 
were the highest level of evidence, just what one of us thought or had an opinion about was the lowest level of evidence or what we were taught by our professors. That is still a low level of evidence. And then everything in between. There's a higher strength of um, validity or higher strength of a recommendation, the higher the level of the evidence, and a larger risk for bias on the lower levels of evidence. We would then assemble all of the papers, all of the evidence on a given topic, and all 144 of those topics, using a letter grade. Um, letter grade A for well-designed, multiple, randomized, controlled trials. Level B for poorly performed or um, randomized controlled trials with some problems in them. Um, observational studies were given level C. And expert opinion, case reports, and reasoning from basic science was given a level of D. Using this method, we came up with the evidence supporting these 16 different causes of rhinosinusitis. And this is the problem that we have. All of these have evidence to support their impact in causing rhinosinusitis. The problem, of course, is that not all 16 are probably active in a patient. Each of them has a very uh, a varying level of evidence. Some have stronger evidence than others. And it's very hard to know which one or two or three or five or 10 are active in any given patient. As we go through this, I just want you to remember all of these different possible causes. Let's look at a few of them, however. As we do that, I want to, do, I want to um, give one caution, and that is the difference between an association and a causal relationship. An association is where two things happen together at the same time. Um, my children stop climbing in trees because they go to school and the leaves change colors in the trees. One has nothing to do with the other. They both happen at the end of summer. But we could say that because my children are not climbing in trees, that made the trees' leaves change color. That, of course, doesn't happen. So in summer, ice cream sales go up. More people swim in the summer, but one has nothing to do with the other. It's just that it's hot weather causing both of those. And so that is the difference between an association and a causal relationship. Let me give you one that's uh, from the history of medicine. In the terrible influenza epidemic from 1918 to 1919, influenza victims were found to have a bacteria in their lungs in what was called astonishing numbers. It was called Pfeiffer's bacillus. And it was the only organism that was present in the lungs that could be found. And initially, other investigators besides Pfeiffer had trouble finding these organisms. Later on, it was shown that they were present in these victims by other investigators. They called this bacteria Bacillus influenzae, and we know it now as Haemophilus influenzae. It didn't cause the death of these patients. The, the inflammation from the influenza virus caused the, inf the problem in the lung and then the bacteria grew on top of that. It didn't cause the influenza, but it was thought to at that same time. So again, not a causal relationship, but an association of two things happening together. So let's look at the evidence. Allergy is frequently cited as a pathogenic factor in chronic rhinosinusitis, and it makes sense. Allergies cause inflammation in the nose, they cause swelling, they cause poor mucociliary clearance. But interestingly, the evidence linking allergy to chronic rhinosinusitis is low and conflicting. One of us could cite studies showing that allergy causes sinusitis, and one of us could 
counter with just as good of studies and just as many of them that show allergy doesn't cause sinusitis. And so we have a low level of evidence for the impact of allergy on sinusitis, and actually it's a level D evidence, a very low level. Now, th that's true for both etiology and management. The, actually, the, impact, the evidence that shows allergy treatment impacts chronic rhinosinusitis is not very good. Now, the only thing to remember is there is local IgE present that we may not see uh, an impact on on allergy testing, and so more information is needed about this to determine what the true role of allergy is. What about biofilms? These have received quite a bit of, uh, of uh, attention. They are complex communities of bacteria and even fungi. Um, that come together and they evade the antimicrobial treatments, antibiotics. Um, they form thick slime layers with water channels and actively pump out antibiotics away from the cells. There's some very interesting work being done by Noam Cohen at the University of Pennsylvania looking at bitter taste receptors. These are receptors that are inside our mouths but also inside our sinuses and they detect bacteria and actually will cause the body to react to them and, it diff and our ability to react to them differs by genetic polymorphisms in these bitter taste receptors. The impact of this is unclear at this point, but the evidence, um, and the, there is no clinical evidence yet on their impact, but there's much more coming out this year, next year, and the year after. Um, so we will be learning more about this. The fungal theory is a very interesting one. This was a theory that came out in 1999. Um, and the theory goes like this. We have an epithelium with mucus on the, on the surface. And in the subepithelial space, we have blood cells with eosinophils that we can see in the subepithelial tissue in many patients. The theory says that fungus sits on the surface of the mucus and attracts the eosinophils. The eosinophils will leave the, cell, the uh, blood vessels, will migrate through the subepithelial tissue, through the epithelium and into the mucus layer where they release proteins that are cationic or destructive to the cells and that these proteins then cause epithelial damage. It's a very interesting theory. Um, one problem with the theory is why are the fungus there to begin with? Fungus take many, many hours to germinate uh, from a spore, and they should be cleared out by the mucociliary clearance in a healthy patient, in a healthy patient. So if there's something else that starts the patient having inflammation and slow muco mucociliary clearance, the fungus can then be there afterwards. So again, this concept was introduced in 1999, received quite a bit of attention. Um, the most compelling evidence was published by Shin in 2004, which showed an enhanced cellular response to fungal antigens in chronic rhinosinusitis patients. We um, replicated that study in every possible way, even trying to get the same lot numbers of fungi that they used in their experiments. Um, we were unable to do that, but we used everything exactly the same, the same reagents from the same manufacturers and replicated that study with a colleague that was, um, that was uh, in, on this paper who was also on ours as well. And we were not able to replicate um, that study using the same protocol. And there have been multiple clinical trials that have failed to show a therapeutic effect of antifungals, um, either oral or topical. And so we think that this may actually be this ice cream phenomenon where two things are happening at the same time, but one is not causing the other. Fungus is not causing sinusitis, most likely. It may be that sinusitis allows fungus to grow on the mucosa, but we don't think it's causing an effect. Reflux is an interesting one. Reflux is a significant factor in post-nasal drip. 
um, many patients will come in to us complaining of mucus going down the back of their nose into their throat, causing them to clear their throats, causing difficulty swallowing the mucus. And we know that reflux can be an issue with that, but is that symptom actually chronic sinusitis or is it simply a matter of reflux? We do know that pharyngeal acid reflux events are associated with chronic rhinosinusitis, especially in patients who fail endoscopic sinus surgery. They have patients who have, a, who have a good surgery where all of the sinuses are open and yet continue to have inflammation do have a higher incidence of reflux. The effect, the effect of gastroesophageal reflux disease treatment on sinusitis however, especially in adults, is unknown. So again, interesting evidence. We're not entirely sure what it means. Um, for me, I always try to discover patients with reflux and treat them aggressively before taking them to surgery so I don't end up finding out after their surgery that they have reflux. Finally, um, what about anatomy and septal deviation? CAT, CT scanning and endoscopic sinus surgery both uh, became prominent in the 1980s and led to many studies examining the anatomic changes that are associated with chronic rhinosinusitis. The idea was that if you fix the anatomy, the sinus problem goes away. And that's not really proven to be true in, many, in most cases. Um, and interestingly, the anatomy doesn't probably pay, play much of a role in chronic rhinosinusitis. Now, in recurrent acute rhinosinusitis, it actually probably does play much more of a role. The narrowed um, eth eth ethmoid infundibulum um, or other anatomic variety variations can be more uh, associated with recurrent acute rhinosinusitis. Interestingly, we see the same thing with chronic rhinosinusitis with septal deviation. It does appear to have a small effect, about a 10%, 6 to 10% increase in the risk of sinusitis with, much, with, with severe septal deviations. What's interesting is that the effect is on both the narrow side as well as the more open side. And so we think that the septal deviation may be causing differences in airflow, possibly in deposition of irritants or particles in the nose, and is not necessarily a narrowing of the, of the uh, ethmoid anatomy. Immunodeficiency, this is one that we are increasingly be, uh, understanding plays an important role. Um, there was a recent systematic review that substantiates the need to search for a primary immunodeficiency in patients who do not improve on standard therapies. We call these recalcitrant chronic rhinosinusitis patients. Often these patients will have multiple lung and ear infections as well. Um, patients uh, should have an evaluate at least of their immunoglobulin levels and also a functional response uh, like from, to a tetanus vaccination. The question is what the most effective treatment is, um, whether it's suppressive antibiotics, immunoglobulin therapy. Um, we don't really have a good idea of how best to treat this. This is very nicely summarized in this article by Dr. Maza and Dr. Uh, Yin, or Dr. Lin. Superantigens are one of the last things we'll look at. Um, these are exotoxins produced by bacteria, particularly Staph aureus. They bypass the selective uh, immune uh, reaction, and they bind uh, the major histocompatibility of the T cell, and they can stimulate a large number of lymphocytes. The way this looks is this is the normal way an antigen is presented to the T cell, but a superantigen will actually bypass this, spec this specific area and will stimulate the V beta uh, variable region of the cell and will then turn on, uh, as I said, up to 30% of lymphocytes. 